Hi, thanks for joining me. My name is Matteo Markle, and I have the great pleasure of hosting this second season of the show. When we talk about environmental action that endures and has a real, long-lasting, sustainable impact, we tend to focus on the larger initiatives sometimes, but really a lot can be done at the smaller scale. Today's story is about an individual who works collaboratively with local communities to develop solutions that benefit them and the environment around them. This is the Unpolluted Podcast, and you're listening to Inspiring Sustainability Stories. Hi, welcome back to the Unpolluted Podcast. Um, Today's episode I'm really excited for because we actually have uh, a guest joining us who reached out to us on Instagram through uh, the Earth Prize Network. And um, I'm really excited to welcome Jeffrey Opuku to this podcast. Hi, Jeffrey. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. I'm super, super glad to be on this Unpolluted podcast by the Earth Foundation. I'm really excited to have you. Um, When I heard your story and met you on Zoom last week, I was really excited to share it because I think it was exactly the sort of thing I was hoping to come out of our audience base. So it would be great if you could introduce yourself to our audience quickly. Just tell us, you know, who you are, a little background on yourself um, and where you're currently based. Um, So, yes, the name goes Jeffrey Dusa Opoku. I am from Ghana. And I'm currently based in Germany doing a, a joint master's program in sustainable development. And this dates way back to 2017. That's when I got introduced into sustainable development goals, the SDGs. And I was really fascinate, fascinated by um, how young people were actually at then contributing towards the SDGs. So I said to myself, I would like to, you know, contribute in the attainment of the SDG targets at a local level. And right after completing high school, uh, when I got back to my community, I actually identified a problem, which was um, the plastic crisis. And I said to myself, I would like to make a change um, with with this plastic pollution problem. So then I started an environmental education program, going to public schools, educating them, um, providing waste segregation bins funded by my mom. And... um, yeah, it was it was pretty amazing. I started with two schools and the success of that project was, you know, really fulfilling for me. And when I got to the university to pursue my first degree in economics, I quite noticed quite the same problem where a lot of students were, you know, not aware of their negative impact of unsustainable habits and lifestyles. The the the, the awareness and the knowledge of the SDGs were eminently low and I felt the need to change the narrative. So that also kickstarted a new initiative when I got to the university, which was the Sustainability Week Accra program, where we co-create a series of activities and events, workshops, hackathons, to engage university students to be involved in the SDGs, to be involved in climate action, and to train university students to become role models of sustainability. So yes, I've been quite involved in a lot of um, sustainable development initiatives, and that is how my journey actually kick-started. Fantastic. Well, I, I think you mentioned a lot of things that I'd love to touch on in this episode. But first of all, you know, you say that you had, at the, at the age of 17, you learned about and developed an interest for uh, the 2030 agenda, the sustainable development goals. And I'm wondering, you know, what, what drew you to sustainability? Um, was it the setting in which you grew up at? I'm just wondering on on that front. So basically, what what drew me to sustainability, yes, was was the 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 SDGs. Um, first and foremost, I saw actually a young kid in my high school. Um, he was actually raising awareness on 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 food f- um food crisis in Somalia, and he was actually raising funds to you know support who have been affected by um, a war that happened in Somalia, Mm -hmm. right? And I mean, he was, I think he was 14 years old. And then he was my junior, basically. And then um, I was pretty much fascinated. I was like, why is a young child, uh, you know, taking such a huge initiative upon himself? So it was through him I got introduced into the SDGs. And 
reading, reading more about the plastic crisis, which was a, um, a problem I wanted to tackle. I got, I had to read a lot, you know, I had to read a lot and I got, you know, the insight on sustainable development, the pillars of sustainability, economics, um, and the environmental pillar and the so social pillar as well. And for me is the reason why I'm much more into sustainability is not just the environmental aspect, but also the economic aspect. I mean, Matt, I know you've been to Ghana before and you look at a country like Ghana, yes, we have a huge environmental issues, but mm -hmm. as well, there are pre-existing fragilities. Um, talking of water, education, um, hunger, you know, these are pre-existing fragilities that, you know, prevents people from having a foresight on tackling issues like climate change, right? So, exactly. Well, where Where is the incentive to act on something as kind of um, non-affecting to my daily life as climate change when, you know, my, my struggle day to day is making ends meet or feeding my family, right? Exactly. So, yeah, exactly. So th this, this has been one of the major issues um, that I've, I've been battling with for a long time because you, you see a lot of young people who are climate activists, a lot of African young people who are climate activists, and I think it's much more important for us not to overlook all these pre-existing fragilities. Mm -hmm. So sustainable development is quite broad. Uh, I feel people just focus so much on the environmental aspect. So that, for me, th th that is the reason why I'm still much involved in sustainability. It's not just the environmental aspect, but also the economic and the social aspect as well. Absolutely. I, I think that's an excellent point that you that you bring up. Um, I, I'd be curious to ask you, you know, you, you spoke about one of the first issues that you became passionate about was this idea of plastic in in your community. And so I'm wondering, you know, what what specifically was was the story behind that? Um, and what did you see that inspired you to take initiative? And, and what were the first steps of, of that initiative? Yeah, with a plastic initiative. Um, okay, so I'll say I actually took action when I was 18 years old. But when I was actually 16 years old, that was when I identified the problem. And I was like, I want to do something with this plastic pollution. So basically, there is this, you know, um, bad habit of the average citizen of littering, you know, plastics in, in environment. And mm -hmm. it's quite unfortunate because in my community, even in schools, in, 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 in public schools, where I feel the, the schools are supposed to serve as uh, the, the space to educate children, Children in schools are actually littering in school compounds. And it was, I mean, wow. it's pretty absurd. So, it was, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wide note problem. And it was something I felt like I would love to do something mm -hmm. to change that. If I could see a 14-year-old boy raising thousands of dollars in funding to, to support children in Somalia, I felt like I could do something around that. So I started by asking friends. Um, what do they think about this? Is, is it solvable? How, how can we go about it? I mean, no one was pretty much interested. So it was like, hey, don't waste your time. Uh, it, 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 not, nothing is going to happen. Nothing is going to change and all that. So it took me two years thinking about what can I do? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think when I got, when I completed high school, that was when I was 18 years and I had to go home for a break. And I was like, I'm going to use this break to start something. So then I... I, I started with the, you know, the public schools in my community. I approached the headmaster and I was like, hey, I would like to start an initiative and help these children become more environmentally inclined to be environmental conscious and, and, and also, you know, to learn how to segregate your waste. So that is how it, it kickstarted. And I expanded it to like three schools in, the, in my community. So you saw um, this 14 year old working for his cause in Somalia and that inspired you to look at the issue of you know students littering on the local school grounds and say okay how can we work with the schools collaboratively to develop a system um, that will you know bring essentially education against littering um, in that community yeah perfect wow that, that that's a fantastic story and I think it, it really shows the, the power of community action you know you, you were talking about how how so many um, of your colleagues were saying, well, you know, is this really something uh, worth doing? Are, are you wasting your time? How, how did that make you feel? I mean, did it bring you down 
and have you doubt what the change that you could make? No, I've not. I've never doubted a change I I I I could actually make. Um, but I feel it's a difficult it's a difficult you know problem, and sometimes you feel like you are too young to do it. It's, mm-hmm. it's too early for you to do it, and you would like to sort of procrastinate or wait a little bit to to have certain resources before you actually make a change. No, so for me, I actually started. I actually started just just like that. I I went to the school, just spoke to them that I want to do something with them. And the headmaster was like, okay. And I mean, I spoke to my mom and my mom was actually my first, you know, uh, project funder. She funded me (laughs) with two, (laughs) my mom actually funded me with two um, segregation bins for the school and I actually did it. So, so basically when, when, after, after this first project, I wanted to scale up Mm -hmm. the project to other schools. So then I was, you know, reading online and I realized that there was a whole new project called Nationwide Waste Education Campaign, which was pretty similar to what I was doing in my community. But theirs is more, you know, quite bigger. Mm -hmm. So I reached out to them um, in the quest of they helping me to scale up what I'm actually doing. But then they liked what I was doing. They, they saw the passion in me and decided to, you know, get me involved into the Nationwide Waste Education Campaign. So then I got involved into the Nationwide Education Campaign, which is more of like, it's quite similar to what I was doing. So, and, you know, it connected me to other ecosystem players as well. And, and is this a, a governmental organization or is this another nonprofit that's also working on education on the, on the national scale in Ghana? So that's also a non-profit, a Recycle Up Ghana. It's a German Ghanaian NGO, also focusing on this, focusing on tackling waste, you know, problem in Ghana and also doing doing it through the waste education campaign. Mm-hmm. Basically doing what I'm, I'm doing at a local level, but, you know, at a much bigger scale. And how did that partnership work out? Were you able to scale the initiative? Yeah, pretty much because then it involved a lot of young people who were like-minded and mm-hmm. it sort of, you know, brought me into a community where I felt I belonged to, uh, a community where other young people were interested in making change. And, you know, it's, it's been an amazing process. You just have to start. And people are just going to say, yes, it's pretty, pretty much difficult to do it, but you just have to start. You don't need all the resources in the world to make a change. You just have to start. So basically, yeah. You just have to start. I think that that's fantastic advice. Um, when you when you talk about you know making impact on the national scale as well, I think you also were telling me that you had um, a, you played a significant role and were involved in the um, Accra Climate Week, and I think that was that was one of the projects that you were working on on a, on a wider scale. Um, and I wanted you to tell us a little bit about that. What is what exactly is it? And um, you know, I think I think that's an initiative that's actually also spread to Af- other African countries that you played a role in starting. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that question. So that is the Sustainability Week Accra, and that was when I go to the university to pursue my first degree. And um, I mean, higher education institutions or universities are in a unique position to you know deliver the SDGs. So. For me, being in a university and seeing a lot of university students not being aware of the ripple effect of, you know, their actions and they not knowing what climate action is, they not knowing what the sustainable development goal is, I felt that's a bit backward. So then I, I felt inclined to change the narrative. That is when I got in touch with a group of students in Switzerland, uh, which is Sustainability Week International. So they were pretty much, you know, tackling the same grassroots problem by organizing um, student-friendly activities to, you know, crowd in more interest into the sustainability ecosystem, make more students become more, you know, environmentally conscious, um, train them to become role models of sustainability. And I was like, I would like to do this in in, in Ghana. So I think, yeah, I contacted, you know, the conveners of the Sustainability Week International, Marie Claire, and... I executed the first local sustainability week in, in Ghana when I got supported by the Swiss embassy in Accra, where we, we did we did a whole full week full of actions, activities, workshops, and it was pretty much amazing. I think this this really caught an uh, you know fire where it's now being replicated in Tanzania, Nigeria, 
and Morocco and Rwanda as well. So wait, if I'm understanding correctly, you, you first, when you were younger, you saw uh, the, the, you felt the need for climate education in the kind of uh, general secondary school environment. And then when you went to university, uh, you found a very similar issue with university age students. Exactly. And, and where was, where was the knowledge gap in your opinion? Was it on um, climate in general? Was it sustainability education, like combining uh, the socioeconomic and environmental lenses. Um, I, I'd just be curious on, on what specifically uh, what was lacking in, in terms of understanding and then how, how you filled that. For me, the, the, the gap was the environmental aspect. At, at then, the gap was the environmental aspect. Mm -hmm. People didn't really care much about you know, environmental action, right? So that was a huge gap. The focus wasn't on real environmental action. Everyone's thinking about profits, 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 and, you know, their lifestyles and all of that. And they didn't see the ripple effect of such mindset and such habits on the ecosystem. So that, that was the gap that I wanted to bridge. But then whilst I was bridging that gap, it also, you know, gave me an insight because then it was pretty much difficult and I didn't understand why I had to convince people to care so much about the environment, right? I didn't understand why I need to convince people to care so much about environmental action. And that is when I got the insights about these pre-existing fragilities mm -hmm. where, you know, understanding why, do, why don't they care so much about climate action? Yeah. And you need Absolutely. to dissect and understand that there are pre-existing fragilities, you know, affecting people in, 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 in you know, society like in Ghana or in other developing countries. So that, that, that sort of gave me an insight to broaden my perspective to, you know, focus on these three pillars and not only on the environmental aspect, but to tackle climate and development together. That's brilliant. I, I think, no, it's really interesting to me that you're talking about that disconnect. And I'm curious, you know, what, what do you say to, to someone who, you know, where, where the expectation or the hope is that they want to engage in some sort of um, climate friendly or sustainable practice, but their priorities are very understandably not right there. How, how do you maybe um, bring environment, you know, towards the top of the, uh, of the priority list? That's a big consulting question. <laughs> so um, I think with that, it, 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 it depends on whosoever wants to integrate env um, you know, environmental sustainability into their operations. So for example, I, I will use an example here. So through the sustainability week that we organized at the University of Ghana, introducing students into sustainability issues, we had a couple of students that were pretty much interested. And I think when we completed school, they started a juice business. Um, and now they, 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 they want to, you know, align their business operation into you know this whole sustainability landscape right because then they are making a juice business so what they do is they go to the eastern region which is in ghana where they have lots of mangoes that go mm -hmm. waste and they try to bring them to accra to instead of instead of these mangoes going waste they produce them into you know juice but unfortunately they have to produce them into plastic bottles right, right. so now they are actually thinking how do they actually contribute to environmental actions? I mean, first and foremost, they're already contributing towards you know, environmental action by transforming this, you know, mangoes into fruit juice so that it doesn't go waste. Mm -hmm. So I had to let them know that they're already contributing towards that. But then they, they were more sort of worried about, you know, the plastics, plastic, plastics. And I think one, one of the ideas I gave them was to, you know, offer services to events or to businesses and they could actually offer their services by producing this juice in glass bottles. Mm -hmm. So this makes it, you know, a zero waste. So there are multiple ways to do it. And I think it will depend on the activity or whatsoever project it is. But, but on, 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 on first look, that's an absolute success. If, if you've come up um, with this education program that then has university students who I think, I, were they studying economics just like you? No, 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 no. They were studying different. So, but, uh, but the fact that those students then go on and, to and found a business and the teachings that are brought through that program are then influencing the decisions on or the thought process on how we can potentially make this a more sustainable enterprise. 
I think that that's very, very valuable. That, that's yeah, that, that has been very, very impactful in, in my view as well. Amazing. I, I think that's a great story. Um, I wanted to touch on a project that you've also worked on more recently, um, and you call it the Education for Adaptation Accelerator. And this is a project with a couple of partners, and I was wondering if you could give us an overview on this project and exactly wh what you've been doing um, in the local community there. Yeah, so um, basically through my journey of, you know, this sustainability week and this plastics and all that, I've been more interested in innovating, you know, for, for sustainable development. So I actually did my master's program in sustainable development. I did a specialization in Austria, which is on in, uh, innovation and transition management. And I actually basically read a lot uh, regarding education for sustainable development because that's what I'm involved at a higher education mm -hmm. level. And I actually realized there is this whole new agenda of greening our educational system. And this has been a conversation that I've been, been on the, you know, on, on, on global um, climate agenda for quite a long time, but seeing real action have been pretty much slow. So because, yeah, so... So the idea that in, in terms of when you describe greening schools, you're talking about, you know, within our global climate agenda needs to be the idea of disseminating climate education at the local level through schools so that students are growing up with an understanding of um, how human actions are impacting the world. Exactly. So, I mean, the conversation are going on at the international level, but I think for, for, for true green education to happen, it's going to happen at the local level. Mm -hmm, absolutely. It must be implemented at the local level, right? And for me, I wasn't seeing, I wasn't seeing lots of action around this, just lots of conversation around that. And I wanted to innovate to do that. So I brought up this Education for Adaptation Accelerator program to incubate schools in Ghana and try as much as possible to adapt the yeah, you know, school system towards climate action and to basically to just green the educational system. Mm -hmm. So I focus on plastics again because this is something that I've been engaged in and something that I have quite much an extensive experience in. And also I decided to focus on food systems as well because... There is a big issue when it comes to, you know, food systems and the Ghana school feeding program is pretty much very, it's very, very bad. So I think I had to focus on this, these two um, areas at the meantime. Wow. Okay. So you're, you're, you're talking about focusing on the plastic system again and the food system as well, because, and I think the food system is kind of a natural one. When we talk about climate impact, there's so much data out there about how if we green our food system, um, the effect we can have is really significant. So I, I wanted to, to touch on plastic first. You were talking um, to me about having partnered with an organization called Break Free from Plastic. And I was wondering um, whether, you know, the, the, the action that you're taking on the ground with the schools, is that similar to the original project that you started when you were 17 about, you know, not littering and uh, bringing, bringing kind of education around cleaning up trash and, and not letting it out in the environment in the first place? Great. So uh, with the current plastic project I'm doing, it's not really the same as I started when, you know, in 2017. Um, when I started, it was pretty much environmental education, which is good. Mm -hmm. And that also introduced me to, you know, the Nationwide Waste Education Campaign that I spoke about, which was quite a bigger version, which is so good. I actually saw, I mean, true, true, true that I actually um so a lot of ecosystem players tackling plastic education and they were quite do doing same thing, educating children on, you know, plastics, setting up green clubs in the schools, providing segregation bins and all that, mm -hmm. which is pretty good. But then I realized that it's, you know, I was 17 years older then. Today I'm, I'm close to 24 and the problem of plastics is still the same, mm -hmm. right? So that tells you that, we can continue to do the same thing if we want a different result, right. right? So I had to, you know, think outside the box and innovate and see what can be done um, aside the traditional way of we tackling plastic, you know, crisis with, with, with schools. So now what I do is trying as much as possible to get the whole school system involved 
from administration to teachers mm. to children involved. Yes, we do the basics, which is plastic education, but then also we make sure uh, we, we, we try as much as possible to um, support you know, the school to commit into fading away plastics in their school campus and installing um, water dispensers and having a school policy where every school children, every teacher, every non-teaching staff, and even the administrators themselves have a reusable bottle. So this is more transformative than we focusing on only, you know, the school children and trying to give them information, um, telling them the impact of the negative impact of plastics. But this, we involve the whole school ecosystem and, you know, yeah, implement or install a dispenser and a reusable, reusable bottle. And I think this gets rid of the plastics in the school system. So you're treating the school as an economy, right? Right. Right. It's like, a, it's like a little economy. And if you can fix that, if you can make that economy sustainable, it's very easy to take that model and then apply it in all kinds exactly. of different scenarios. Exactly. Fantastic. And, and then you mentioned that you focus on food as well. And you partnered with an organization that I'd never heard of, but found to be really interesting. Bean is how. I was wondering if, yeah. if you could tell us about that and about the work that you're doing on the ground with them. So um, with a food system, I also basically want to do you know, transform the, the school meals that are being offered to children because children at, at a very young age form their eating habits. And that is a window of opportunity for us to, you know, introduce them into sustainable um, lifestyles or sustainable food system as well. Because when you grow up, it's very difficult to break old habits. So with a food system, uh, we do food education, but the unique thing here that, um, we are doing this, we actually connect, you know, children to local food system heroes like market women. So market women are people, you know, selling this food from farmers. And, you know, when you go to Ghana, this is actually um, jobs that a lot of women actually are involved in for like close to 20 years, 25 years. And they have rich insights into food preservation, food waste, you know, uh, food health, rich insight, but these are not documented and we don't really, really uh, involve them when it comes to food system innovation. So what we do is to look, we are trying to promote a local food knowledge by connecting school children to market women and farmers to have conversation around food systems and local food education as well. That is one aspect. The second aspect is also to introduce, you know, plant-based diets options for children. And that is where Beans is How comes in. And Beans is How is uh, a campaign by SDG2 Advocacy Hub to increase beans consumption by 2028. So beans are affordable. Beans are, you know, nutritious. And as well, they are also good for our soils mm -hmm. and our environment. So this, this is, I feel this Beans is How is basically a very good alternative plant-based diet. Yeah that I feel we can also introduce into schools. So that is how business how comes into the picture. Absolutely. A, a, different, a different way of getting protein in a much more sustainable fashion. Um, excellent. So, so in terms of the beans is how diet, are, are, you implement, are you trying to implement that in the school with the cafeterias uh, so that the students end up having more meals with, with beans locally? Exactly. So... Um, we work with the, 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 the school cafeterias to sort of redesign their school meals to include like um, bean based meal at most twice a week. And it's pretty much fascinating because food is, is, is diverse in every country. And in Ghana, I don't know if you've, if you've, you've had a feel of wachi and the beans and plantain. I don't know if you, you took that when you were in Ghana. Mm. But these are bean bean based meal, you know. Mm -hmm. These are bean based meal, and particularly the beans and plantain, um, is is one of the popular bean based meal in Ghana. So the the idea here is to just make it amplify that, make it more popular, and make more people consume that, right? And I mean, a lot of people consume that, so the as, as, as acceptance of such bean based meal is is pretty much easy to do. It's I mean, not like I'm we are trying to introduce 
something from the West. Right, to... right. <laughs> no, 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 no. Right, that was going to be my next question about, you know, whether the students are, are, are very accepting of, you know, a meal that has beans in it. But what, what you're saying is that that's actually part of the local culture anyway. So all you're doing is, is promoting that and, and make, trying to make that more uh, of a regular um, happening in the, in the school cafeteria so the students don't actually mind, right? Actually. Wow, okay. Um, I think I wanted to touch on acceptance a little bit more in general. Because when we when we look at what what it what it's like to take action on the ground, I mean, you mentioned I, I've had the fortune of, of visiting Ghana, and our, our local partners there are, are very adamant about anything any solution that's implemented needs to be implemented hand in hand with the local people, so that they understand what's happening, so that they agree with what's happening, and so that um, the collaboration is really what makes things succeed. And so I'm wondering how how has that been for you? Um, trying to, you know, make an impact on the ground? And has it perhaps been um, easier for you considering that your background is originally that you're Ghanaian? Yeah, with, with, with acceptance, I feel, I mean, studies actually shows that sustainable innovations in existence are actually done through collaborations, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of mistakes that some people do is maybe because they feel they have certain knowledge through maybe school, through their master's program or PhD, they feel they could make a change, you know, locally. It doesn't work that way. You really have to work with the people. You have to involve the, uh, the people in the process. So for me, my methodology and approach of work have been on building bridges of partnerships, sowing seeds of collaborations. And it's, it speaks through all my works. So with the full system uh, project that we are doing, through the E4AA, adapting, you know, the schools in Ghana to become green schools. We actually collaborate with market women. We make them involved. Uh, we're talking about food education. They have rich insights into food education. And these insights are not actually documented in textbooks, right? And if you look at the Ghanaian education system, it's actually based on the British um, curriculum, mm -hmm. right? So collaboration is really, really key when it comes to acceptance. And that has been my methodology of work. So I'll pretty much say that. Amazing. It, yeah, I, I, really, I really do hear about that, that theme of acceptance very, very often. Um, I think that was a fantastic story. I'd, I'd like to go into one of the traditions that we're trying to start here on the Unpolluted podcast, as you may know. And we'd like to take a guest, a question from our uh, previous guest and give it to a current guest and let you, the current guest, um, give us a question. So I think the question I'd like to ask you um, is going to be from Peter McGarry, the founder of the Earth Prize, a $100,000 environmental competition for teenage students around the world. Um, and in episode two, he was talking about, you know, some of the some of the more challenging things that he's done. And he said the hardest thing he's ever tried to do was put together the Earth Prize because there were so many different people involved and it was just a huge undertaking. And so I'm wondering, what was the hardest thing for you to do in your local setting? Local setting. I think my, 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 the hardest thing for me was to start the sustainability week in, in Ghana mm -hmm. because then I was pretty much young. I had zero idea about event organization, project management, volunteer coordination. I had Zero idea about that. My only experience was just providing environmental education to two public schools, and mm -hmm. that was it. But then going to university and already I, you know, got into the, got into this project, and I realized that it was pretty much a very very big project for me. And then, and I had to also f find funding for such a project, which mm -hmm. it was pretty much hard for me. And what what I did was to be, you know, proactive to try my best and fail and learn as well. Mm -hmm. So, for example, how did I find find the funding? What I did is pretty much a secret out there to other young activists. <laughs> um, I just went online looking at um, international organizations and inter intergovernmental organizations working in the area of sustainability, and I. 
I just do cold emailing, just telling them about my passion, what I want to do uh, in, in my university, the things I want to change, just cold ma- emailing, you know, hundreds of organizations. Wow. And luckily, the Swiss Embassy actually called me that they are interested in funding, you know, the, the, the project. And I had to manage such a project at such a, a young age. That was pretty much difficult. Combining that with my academics in economics, super, super times too difficult. So that has been one of the hardest things I've ever done. But um, that, has, that, that is what has shaped me to be who I am today. So I am pretty much grateful for going through that process. Yeah, you mentioned that idea of, of failing forward, right? Like learning from the mistakes that you've made and not seeing them as mistakes, but as opportunities to grow and learn. And, and you mentioned how, how difficult it was to implement Sustainability Week. Did you have um, some some support network for that? Was there, was there someone who was um, guiding you through the process or, or were you very much um, kind of treading, treading water and, and trying to trying out different things? Um, yeah, I, I basically didn't do it alone. I had to, you know, find like-minded students who were interested. So um, I, uh, we, there was this call to three members uh, for Sustainability Week, mm-hmm. myself, Ninoy, and Nabila. And we had to crowd in a lot of students to be volunteers as well. So it was pretty much our first experience. None of us had experience in doing this. And, but as the saying goes, there's always, you know, a first try. So it was pretty much a, a good a good process and experience for me to 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 go through. There's always a first try. I I think that's exactly. good. Good advice. Um we've heard our our question to you and I I'd, I'd be curious on what maybe a question from you to a next guest on the Unpolluted podcast might be. What would you ask them? So my question to the next guest would be was that one thing you've always wanted to do, but you still haven't done it yet? And when are you looking forward to doing it? I think that's an excellent question. It's nice to get questions that are beyond the sustainability realm, and we get to know our guests a little bit more personally. Um, thank you very much for your question. I think it was fantastic for us to get to share your story. So I want to thank you again for coming on and joining me on the Unpolluted podcast. And I, I just like to leave with a quote that I found on um, the the Bean is How website, and that is mm. it's about sowing the seeds of a sustainable future, one bean at a time. At a time, I, exactly. I found that a great quote. Um, in any case, thank you so much for joining me, Jeffrey. I hope you enjoyed our discussion, and I look forward to hearing where your story brings you in the future. Thank you so much. That concludes this episode of the Unpolluted Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in to join us. Um, I'd like to especially extend my gratitude to Jeffrey Opuku for bravely coming on and letting me share his story. As always, if you enjoyed this podcast, like us, follow us um, on social media at The Earth Prize, and share the podcast with someone else who might enjoy it. Um, You can also reach out to me with any questions or any feedback at Earth Mateo on Instagram. Thanks for joining us, and stay sustainable.